everyone. Welcome to lesson 8-3. In this lesson, we are going to be looking at different ways to display some of the data that we've been talking about in the first two lessons here. We're going to look specifically at three different ways to display data in this lesson. In this first video, we're going to take a look at frequency tables and dot plots. And then in the next video, we'll look at histograms. And then we'll kind of take a look at what the different ways to describe these different visual representations are. All right, so not going to waste too much time here in the intro. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, so as I mentioned in the intro, the first visual representation that we're going to look at is going to be a frequency table. So a frequency table is going to be a chart where we're going to tally how often a piece of data occurs. So we're going to count up how many times something happens within a certain range. So let's go ahead and jump in and look at this frequency table. We are given a set of data points, 61, 67, 81, 83, 87, 88, 89, 90, 98, 99, and 100. And then you see we have kind of a shell that we're going to be filling in for our frequency table. Now you may see this in different forms while you are working through these. Sometimes you may have the intervals already filled in for you right here so that you don't have to do much thinking. But then other times like this, you will have to come up with the intervals on their own. Now, <clears throat> it is a little bit flexible as to how you come up with the intervals. I'm going to show you kind of a good guideline on how to determine those intervals. But really, uh, everybody's frequency table may be a little bit different based on how you decide to display your data. That's one kind of cool thing about this is that you are each in control of your own way of displaying the data. So yours might not look quite the same as a neighbor's. All right, so <clears throat> one thing I like to do when I'm doing a frequency table is to go ahead and put this data in order. And we are lucky enough in example one that that's already been done for us. We start with our lowest and it goes to our highest. So one strategy to use when you are coming up with these intervals, <clears throat> and sorry for me clearing my throat, I got a little bit of a cold, so just bear with me. But we are going to find the range of these values. So I'm going to look at my highest value, which is 100. <clears throat> and I'm going to subtract my lowest value, which is 61. This is going to kind of give me a good idea of how spread apart this data is and what kind of size range I need to cover with my intervals. All right, so when I do 100 minus 61, that's going to give me 39. So the next thing I'm going to do is look at how many different intervals they've given me in this shell that they've given that I can use as an outline. And I see that they have given me one, two, three, four rows. So I want to try and spread out this 39 that's our range as evenly as possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to round that up to 40. Um, and I'm going to divide by 4. Because I basically am covering 40 different areas of data. And I'm trying to cut it into 4 sections. The one rule that is going to be important when you are doing these intervals is that once you pick what your interval is, it has to stay the same size for every interval you do. So you can't group like the first row by 10 and say the next group's only going to include five. It has to be the same <clears throat> size every time. So when I do 40 divided by four, that's going to give me 10. So <clears throat> I'm going to try and count these by 10 and see what happens. So I'm going to go look at my data again. My lowest was a 61 and my highest was a 100. So I have to make sure that I can include at least those points. So remember I said that I wanted to do intervals of 10. So I'm going to start at my lowest. Sometimes you might start exactly at what that point is. Sometimes you might start a little bit lower. But I'm going to go from 61 to 70. And then my next set I'm going to go from 71 to 80. And I think you'll start to see a pattern here. I'm going to go 81 to 90. And I'm going to go 91 to 100. And that's going to make sure that we include everything from our lowest point to everything to our highest point. And now <clears throat> it's pretty simple from here on out. Again, you might come up with different intervals. The main rule is going to be that you include all your data. You don't want any points left out. And then your second rule is that you're going to have the same size interval. In this case, all mine were 10. If you had decided you wanted to be different and do every one by 11, that's fine. As long as you stuck with that 11 every time. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to count up how many of each set of numbers is going to occur. So I'm going to look for all my numbers between 61 and 70. So I have a 61 here, so that's going to be 1. And I'm just going to make a little tally mark. 
and then 67 is also between 61 and 70, so I'm going to put another tally mark. Now, I don't see any numbers between 71 and 80. That's okay, that just means I'm not going to put a tally mark. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the next number that shows up, and that's going to be 81, which falls between 81 and 90. So I'm going to put a tally mark there. My next number is 83 and 87, 88, 89, and then the last number that's going to squeeze into this interval is going to be 90. All right, that wraps up all the numbers between 81 and 90. So the last thing I'm going to do is look for the numbers that fall between 91 and 100. So 98 is going to be included, so I'm going to put a tally mark. 99 is going to be included, so I'm going to put a tally mark. And last but not least, we have our number 100, which is included. Now we want to make sure that we've got all our data points. Uh, you can always count up how many points you started with. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And add up your total number of tally marks. We have 6 plus 3 plus 2. That's going to give us 11. And that is going to mean that we have included all of our data points. Now, one other way that you may see a frequency table written, sometimes they might not use tally marks. Sometimes they might actually write out what the number is. So this would be one way to see the uh, frequency table. But sometimes you might see it with actual numbers like 2, 0, 6, and 3. You just need to be able to go back and forth between the two and recognize the two different forms. And that's pretty much all we have for frequency tables. So let's go ahead and move on to our next type of way to display data. And that's going to be a dot plot. A second method of displaying data, like I said, is just called a dot plot. And a dot plot is constructed by drawing a number line and placing a mark each time a data piece occurs. This is tedious, it is boring, but it is super easy. All right, <clears throat> so... We're going to be given the number line, and we're going to want to, again, look at how far we're going to have to stretch our data. So I'm going to look for my lowest point and the highest point. It can help you to put this in order, but it is not necessarily required. We can go through it uh, without doing that. So <clears throat> I'm going to look for my highest and my lowest. My lowest, I don't see anything lower than a 1, and I don't see anything higher than a 9. So when I do my number line, I want to make sure that I go from at least 1 to 9. A good guideline that I like to do is I like to start my dot plots one number below your lowest and go one number higher than your highest. So what you will do is you will just take your number line that you're given. Sometimes you may have to use a ruler and draw your own. But you're just going to mark across it and you're just going to make a number line. So I'm going to start at zero since my lowest number is a one. I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine was my highest, so I'm going to go one higher to ten. Now it's okay if you don't go the whole way across the number line. Yeah, it looks a little prettier if you're able to do it symmetrical, but as long as you've got your numbers down, that's going to be the important part. So I'm just going to erase these little marks here for a second just so they don't get distracting when we get to our next step. But now basically all we're going to do whenever we make a dot plot is every time we see a number in this number summary of the set of data here that they're giving us, we're going to make some sort of mark. Typically, you'll see X's. Sometimes you might actually see dots. Sometimes I've seen things like smiley faces, depending on what they're talking about. One other thing I should point out is different ways you might see things on this, and we'll talk a little bit about this more after we make the dot plot. It doesn't necessarily have to be numbers on the bottom of your dot plot. You might also sometimes see categories. Uh, for example, if you were talking about eye color or your favorite color or favorite sports team, you could still represent this type of data in a dot plot, putting an X for each answer. Uh, you just wouldn't have the numerical values to go with it. So making a dot plot, like I said, is a little bit tedious, but it is super easy. Just every time I see a number, I'm going to make a mark on that number. So I have a 2, so I'm going to put an X on that 2. I have a 1, so I'm going to put an X on that 1. We want to make sure we keep it about the same height as we go across. That way it's easy to compare. And I have a 4. And this is going to be super boring for you guys to watch. I have another 2. So what I'm going to do as I go through this is I'm just going to go ahead and pause the video, let you guys fill this in yourself, and then we'll pick back up with the filled in dots. So we'll see you in just a second. All right, turns out that it was a good thing that I paused the video right there because as soon as I stopped the recording, the program completely crashed on me. 
So I have now replotted all those data points. You should have a uh, dot plot that now looks like mine, making sure that you are putting in the dots each time that you see the number. Now, a couple mistakes that I see when students have been making dot plots in the past. Uh, one thing that jumps out right away is uh, if a number is not included, like in here, we included every number from 1 to 9. But let's say, for example, that there were no 7s on this set of data. We only have one 7. Let's say that 7 was completely missing. All right, when you're making your number line, you still have to number 7 on your number line. You can't just skip 7 and say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8. You still have to leave the 7 there, even if there's no dot on it. You still have to make sure you include it on your number line, because our number line just can't jump willy-nilly. The other thing is, <clears throat> a lot of times on tests or worksheets, you will actually be given a dot plot, and you'll have to find information from it. The key thing to remember is that each one of those X's is part of your data. So if, for example, sorry, I have a little trouble breathing with the cold. <clears throat> if you were asked to find the mean, you would need to include a number for each of those X's. So for example, if you're finding the mean of this data set, you would have to add up 1 plus 1 plus 1 because there's three ones, and then plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 because there's four twos. You have to make sure that each of those X's are represented by a separate number. You can't just do 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 and so forth. Um, also, when you're finding things like your mode, you're just going to be looking for the one that has the most dots. If you're looking for range, you'll look for where your highest X is and subtract where your lowest X is. Um, so different things like that. And we'll make sure you guys get some practice on that before we put it on the test. But that is a, uh, some places that we have seen people mess up in the past. All right, we got one more thing to cover in this video. I know this is getting a little bit long. I apologize for that. Uh, but we're just going to knock out this last part and then we will be good. All right, so <clears throat> I kind of mentioned this earlier, but in addition to summarizing numbers like we were doing in those first two examples, we can also summarize what is called categorical variables and quantitative variables. Quantitative variables are like we were just looking at the numbers. Categorical variables are those things I was talking about like eye color or favorite sports team or favorite color or favorite TV show. Those kind of things are all categorical values. They aren't represented by numbers, but instead they are represented by things that are just categories, hence the name categorical. Whereas what the first two examples that we looked at, quantitative variables, <clears throat> are all things that are numerical values that represent a measurable qual quantity. So we are going to take a look at just one categorical example. Most of yours in here, since we're looking at data and statistics, will be shading towards the quantitative side, but we do want to expose you to the categorical side as well. So I apologize that we didn't leave you guys much room for example three. You might need to do this on a sheet of notebook paper and kind of just keep it close to your notes. Uh, I am going to actually jump onto another page myself to make sure that I have enough room, but we are going to go ahead and construct a frequency table and a dot plot to represent the shirt size data. So this time you're going to have to kind of draw your own. I know, it's asking a little much of you. We don't give you one. You have to make your own. All right, we're still going to split in two, and we're going to have our categories. Now this time it's going to be a little bit easier for our frequency table. Because this is categorical, we don't have to do the whole guessing and checking on what's going to be a good range of values. We can just say each category is its own category. So we're going to put all the smalls together. We're going to put all the mediums together. We're going to put all the largest together. And we're going to put all the extra largest together. And then finally, we're going to put all those extra larges. All right, so we're going to work this the same way that we did when we were working through it with a number set. <clears throat> Just every time we see this size, we are going to mark it on our chart. So these aren't in any sort of order, so I'm just going to go through. I have a small, so I'm going to put a small. Another small here, another small here, another small here, another small, and one more small down here. All right, so again, you're just going to tally these as you go. Again, I'm going to pause the video, allow you to go ahead and do the tally marks for this, and then we'll come back up and pick what the next step. All right, so I have gone ahead and tallied the rest of that frequency table like you should have done while you had the video paused. 
Also, I have just to give you an example of what I was talking about earlier, how sometimes you will see it with tally marks, sometimes you will see it with actual numbers. I've gone ahead and thrown a frequency table up there right next to it that is going to be based off of the numbers instead of tally marks as well, just so you can see that we're going to have the same amount in each one, just two different ways to display the data. All right, the last thing is to construct the dot plot. And one thing that actually is <clears throat> possible to do now is we have already constructed our frequency table, so we can use that when we are helping to make our dot plot. Now, the only thing I'll caution you on is if you base this off the dot plot, if you mess the dot plot up, you're going to mess this up too. So it might be more beneficial to go back to the uh, original data if you are not sure, but if you're pretty comfortable in your frequency table and you think that you're good to go, then you can use this to kind of be a baseline for your uh, dot plot. Forgot what it was called there. All right, so this time instead of putting numbers along our number line, we are again just going to use our categories. So I had a small, medium, a large, an extra large, and then some double XLs. So all we're going to do is every time that we had one of these represented, we're going to put an X. So I'm going to use my frequency table since I just counted up those, and I know for sure that those are right. For smalls, I had six. So I'm going to put one, two, three, four, five, six. For mediums, I had three. So I'm going to put one, two, three. For larges, I have four. One, two, three, four. For extra larges, I have five. One, two, three, four, five. And then I had just two extra larges. All right, so that wraps up video one. I apologize that they get a little bit lengthy. Uh, there are no U-tries after this video. We will pick up with the U-tries after video two. See you guys there.